Welcome back to Coding Shorts. My name is Sean Wildermuth. I'm back recording videos and I'm very excited about it. I also do want to just put in a quick plug for my Pragmatic Architecture course for .NET that's coming up on February 24th. You can see a link on the screen now. What I'd like to talk to you about today are databases, specifically databases in .NET. Now, many of us use Entity Framework to sort of automate our querying and inserting of data into specific databases. But if you're like me, you've been using SQL Server for so long that you really don't think about using other databases for other reasons. Now, I'm not talking about NoSQL versus SQL. I'm really talking about treating a database as a data store instead of a direct database that you're going to end up dealing dealing with. I've noticed in development that a lot of projects are moving toward Postgres or Postgres SQL. And I've been sort of hesitant. It's an open source database. It can be cheaper to deploy on AWS and Azure than SQL Server, but I never really had the time to dig in. And luckily, because we're using SQL Server, that can be a pretty painless experience. So today I'm going to show you a project using SQL Server, switch it to Postgres SQL, and let's see it work. Let's get started. So here I have a really simple project. It just has a couple of APIs and it exposes some data here as a context object and we're using SQL Server to run it. So if I go ahead and run this, we're going to open up our test rest and we can go ahead and query this customer's data I have, right? It's all kind of standard. I could even go look at an individual customer. Super simple. Now, what I'm not implying here is that your projects are going to be nearly as simple as this tiny little project. But I think it's a good way for us to think about and see how we could use other databases. One of the things to explain is we're actually using the store context and we are generating each of the customers using some data I have in here. When I've created the migrations, the migrations actually include all that data. So it's injected into the database during the migration, and then we have some data. So we really can start from a brand new empty database if we want. And that makes it a little easier here to work with Postgres. I'm just going to show you a quick Compose YAML that can be used to get up and running with a Postgres database immediately just by using a Docker container. You could, of course, install it locally or have some network resource that does this as well, but I find this to be the easiest. And so if I open up a console, I can just say Docker Compose up. And so we now have a perfectly willing version that works, but we then need to switch our project over to Postgres. So there's a couple pieces here. First, I'm actually going to need to debug here because I can't add NuGet packages until we stop it. So let's go ahead and manage NuGet packages. And I'm just going to search for Postgres. What we're really looking for here is NPG SQL, Entity Framework for Postgres SQL. Let's go ahead and install it. We're also going to need Entity Framework Design. This is implied by the SQL Server when we get it, but it's not implied by the Postgres. So we need to install it separately. It's actually being used in the SQL when we do migrations and such. So with those two additions, and if we look at the csproj file, we'll see that it's installed this Postgres Entity Framework, and then we have that design that we've added as well. And so how do we change this over to Postgres SQL? Well, what we can do here, now that we have this in here, we can actually just change the configuration to say use in PG SQL, which is Postgres. And here we're going to look for a builder.configuration, just like we did before, get connection string. And this time I'm going to store it in store DB Postgres. I'm just going to add another connection string there for us to use. And so if I look at my app settings, I have this connection string here. And we need a new format for Postgres. So if we look at that compose again, we'll actually see that we use a username, a password, and then what port it's on. And so we can do the same thing here host equals local host, username equals some user, password equals, I have to know that password by heart, but again, I'm getting it directly from this Postgres. Port equals 5432, which is the default port. And then finally, we need a name of a database. And I'm just going to call it store DB for now. now. Unsurprisingly, if we just run this, go back to our little test, it's going to complain because there's no store DB and there's obviously no data in there. We haven't really done anything to make that work. So we need to actually use the migrations. Now, unfortunately, migrations are specific to a data store. So once we've stopped the project, we can go ahead and let's create a new developer shell. And if I do .NET EF database update, it's going to complain immediately the database. Essentially, this is a problem because 
for using SQL Server types here. So, so I'm just going to get rid of that migrations folder. And let's go ahead and run migrations to add a new migration for Postgres. And so let's move those migrations back into data. That's just house cleaning that I like to do. And if we now do .NET EF database update, so the first time you run the migrations, you get this error because this stored database that we specified doesn't exist. And this is a little bug in the migrations for Postgres. I'm not sure exactly why they expect the database to exist, but if we actually just run it a second time, it will have created the database, but it failed to do the migration. So running it a second time means that we now have that data. If I open up PG Admin, which is a tool for looking at the databases, you could use other tools as well to connect, but PG Admin is nice and easy. So here's that local host server. And here, once we open it, we'll see that there's now a store DB in here. And if we look at schema, then tables, we'll see all our familiar tables are in there. And so this should imply that if we run this, let's go back to our test, that we're back in business. And let's take a look at 50 here we can get it. So our whole API works. And so really what this required was using the NPG SQL instead of use SQL Server, as well as regenerating the migrations. Now, there may be other ways, maybe not using migrations and having update scripts that you run on either one of them. And I found that the SQL that you would use with SQL Server is different from Postgres, though there are some tools out there for converting schemas from one to the other that I've used successfully. Uh, and I'll put a link to one down in the show notes. But in essence, we haven't changed anything because we're not using raw SQL. We're using any framework to really change that. So where does that leave us? I'm not advocating Postgres over SQL Server. I'm advocating looking at data stores that work with Entity Framework or looking at data stores that work with Entity Framework that may not be just what's out of the box with SQL Server. It may have benefits to scalability, to price, etc. that you want to take advantage of by looking far afield to different kinds of databases that work with Entity Framework. Now, you might not be using Entity Framework at all. You're using something like Dapper or some other tools to get to your database, this probably won't be quite as easy, especially with Dapper, you're generating, you're writing the raw SQL, and that SQL is apt to be a bit different between SQL Server and Postgres. One of the big changes is that Postgres table names and field names are case sensitive. So unless you've been pretty careful, you're gonna run into problems with your pure SQL, but it is still SQL. There's very little difference except for maybe data types and case sensitivity. One last plug for my architecture course coming up, on February 24th. You can see the link over to it now. Early bird pricing is over, unfortunately, but there's still a few seats if you want to sign up now. This has been Sean Wilderuth for Coding Shorts. Thanks for watching.